Okay, there we are. Um, Robert, you... Well, let me start. I mean, uh, please uh, be our guest, but I'll start now. Because you added with a few questions. Um, I think there's a very good ending for a new beginning. Um, you remarked a couple of things, and one of the things was the, uh, the contrast. Uh, maybe the uh, irreconcilability of the idea of uh, expressivissimo, as you find it in the work of Uswalskaya, yeah? and on the other hand, uh, the anorganic qualities that seem to be so uh, well, so, so fundamental for her uh, uh, music, um, has one of us maybe to comment on this strange contrast. I mean, is the espressivo, is it really uh, um, an, an alpha is it really uh, uh, an, inf an, an invitation for the performer, or is it rather a description of what is already happening in the music, one might ask? Um, there is sort of one situation I, I want to discuss because it immediately comes to mind since the performance was very recently. <clears throat> the final two pages of the Grand Duet, um, after the moment where the piano coda comes in with the material of the beginning of the piece, we have a short pause and then the solo, a cello comes in with a solo, um, interval of augmented octave, three piano is marked and it says expressivissimo how do you what what do you do with it yes you want you want sound to have this laser like beam penetrating intensity especially if it's in a big concert hall so do you go for expressivissimo or do you go for three three p and um, I, I i mean i always when we performed, and I performed this, this work with a few cellists, we always took expressivissimo as the main indication and the sound which is quiet, but it, it sort of cuts through. And this, this, is, uh, this is my sort of understanding of this. And she often writes expressiva when um, the notes are marked with accents or with little sort of tenuta signs and again the dynamic can be three forte and four forte and for example in my situation when we rehearsed we discussed it I mean what is four forte? Are you supposed to break the piano? Are you supposed to break the violin or cello? What, what is it? Is it a quantitative sort of remark or is it a request of the maximum intensity of some kind of message which is beyond human sort of emotional scale. I, I don't know, to me it's always very, very re relative, but it's a request for a maximum of something, of, 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 of sound, of, of what attitude, of emotion. This is my understanding of yeah. expressivism. Um, well, it could also be a token of helplessness, so to say. I mean, please don't take my notes only for notes, not, not only for... for 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 uh, very loud sounds, but there is meaning in it. I think this espressivo might mean uh, espressivissimo. <laughs> yes, might mean well. Uh, these are not objets sonores, so to say. This is not uh, uh, a meaningless or just formal sound. Uh, it's 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 these are sounds with a meaning, whatever that meaning may be. But. I it's see a maximum of meaning. So mean, meaning, yes, yeah. Could it be a good question for the piano players, for instance? How do they do it? Please. Will you, would you comment? Uh, I grab a microphone. Or? Yeah. Uh, uh, this, yeah. Oh. Well, for for me, I kind of I read it as a sort of a, a futility of the performer. In this uh, passage in the sixth sonata, there's uh, these repeated clusters with the, with the whole arm and with the hand that alternate. And it's uh, from quadruple fortissimo with the crescendo to quintuple fortissimo. And I mean, if there isn't anything 
there isn't any difference, I think, in the sound of the instrument from these two markings, or a way of making this crescendo audible. But what this has to do with is, I think, the energy the performer puts into it. So that it, that it is also, in a way, it's the same role as the speaker in the symphonies, that uh, it's kind of, you're helpless expending this energy when the, the sound will continue in the same way without and in the same way, regardless of your effort. So it's, uh, yeah, I think it's a prescriptive notation rather than a descriptive one. Mm -hmm. The other thing that I th uh, is interesting, I was almost thinking about it as a, um, a question to ask, is um, the idea of singularity and her music and this uh, and repetition. So in the fifth sonata, you hear this, uh, the D flat is repeated. Uh, quite a lot, but uh, <laughs> the um, interesting thing for me about this is that uh, as you play the piece, the piano becomes not so subtly detuned, so that the D flat is never the same twice. It's a process, and it's also the same with these re uh, repetitive clusters in the sixth sonata, that it's a gradual kind of uh, a process of deformation or of, uh, oh, I'm not actually not sure what is happening with this process or how intentional it is, but I think it's at least one of the most distinctive features of these late works. Yeah, that's, that's, that's what we experience. I mean, that's what we hear. That's true. I don't know if it's intended, but it's what we hear. Sure, sure. But it, but it happens in every performance. I don't think I've heard. Well, <laughs> your colleague. Um. Yeah, I basically agree. I just wanted to add that I think uh, proportion, uh, um, if you compare it to other music uh, written at, at least for piano, it has relatively few notes and I think the espresso also shows that yes, every note really has to say something because there are fewer notes uh, than normal. And it's just a, it's a means of like, it, it really speaks, and if you look at it on a page, it can look very much like just black in terms of a lot of clusters, but everything has such a strong meaning, and it's like speaking, and it's that kind of an emotion that you have when you speak, I think, also. Thank you. Who else? I have I agree with Anna-Leo. I think uh, the first thing I wanted to explain, uh, because uh, performance, when they see the, the score, they think, oh, it's peanuts, only a few notes. I think she really wants to explain the hidden virtuosity in her music. So focus on every note. Hidden virtuosity, that's... Uh, yeah, that's a good term, yes. Who else, please? Yeah, sure. Um, I absolutely agree. Very few notes, but all of us who performed it, I'm sure you agree with me, the experience is exhausting. <laughs> Physically and mentally exhausting. You play one piece, and I'm not even talking about the sonatas, five and six, but even if, for example, you play a trio or a sonata where we don't have that much um, real physicality, but you, you, you walk off stage and you really feel that you just don't want to move. Everything you had inside you, mentally, emotionally, physically, you, you're drained, you're emptied. Uh, and I think that's, in a way, that's what she wanted. This, this is the message she put in. That's what I think she, she meant saying that the performers and musicologists who write about my music, they have to suffer. And she uses the word, stradat, vi stradat suffer through my works in the same way I suffered. And I, I think we all performer, we sort of, we know what, what, what she means. Ah, this is from my experience and I, I, I'm sure you all agree with me. May I ask a question to Olga? Yes. Um, to begin with a tiny question, you showed, a, you showed us a handwriting of Ustolskia. Uh, early handwriting, uh, which you found in the, in the archives of the conservatory, 
and um, uh, which I didn't know because I know a, a late handwriting of hers of the Second Symphony, which is also very uh, uh, hard to uh, decipher. And I always thought it had to do with well some some late illness of her. Uh, but then I saw this same uh, complete uh, well I don't know the word for it, but uh, a messy handwriting. And you um, interpreted it as a maybe as a sign of let's say mental uh, mental shock or mental stress, something like that. Uh, do you know if this handwriting has been a constant thing in a career, and uh, or has this mental mental stress been a constant thing in her career? Um, uh, what concerns handwriting? Um, I'm sorry I left my iPad and my uh, hotel number because I actually could show the whole uh, thing, the, the whole selection of the uh, documents from the dossiers. And you can see it starts at uh, when she was uh, entering the, conser the conservatory as a student, as an undergrad student in 1939, so quite um, um, a few years before the note I was shown. And it, uh, you can really see the change because in the earliest document the handwriting is legible and it's even could call be uh, nice, beautiful handwriting. So everything later is worse and worse. But uh, normally in this period her handwriting is not very even but it is understandable. So why that note caught my attention that it stands out? from the handwriting of, that, uh, of the period. And, and you're right, because in the latest course, the handwriting gets worse and worse and worse. And probably this has to do with increased um, secluded way of life and uh, change in psychology as well. Yeah. Um, I, think, yeah. I think, just briefly to interrupt there briefly, something to do with her health is also present because it's not just a sort of agitation in the handwriting as she gets older, but there is a shake to it as well, certainly, when she gets older. So there is an element of health that does impact on the handwriting. Which was not present in the note I was showing no, yet. No. Yeah, it's just the angularity and illegibility. And one more observation. I'm not sure I should say that because I'm not an expert on handwriting and I haven't uh, asked specialists to perform a graph graph graphologic <laughs> analysis of that, but um, the examples of the normal handwriting from that years to me look very similar to Shostakovich's handwriting. And it's uh, a very frequent uh, thing that people who communicate a lot and who exchange uh, with meaningful ideas and the teacher-student relationship, I have, I, I know examples of other relationships between teachers and students, when the student's handwriting becomes, lo uh, uh, becomes looking like the teacher's handwriting. So I wonder if this is the case, and probably that's the question to all social psychology specialists. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I just wanted to add, um, when you showed us a document, um, it was quite early and this, the, the handwriting was quite well readable, and you said, this is very nice and clear. Well, I, I don't know, there are lots of mystery about Ostorska, but uh, in one of the interviews I conducted in St. Petersburg, always, um, Ostvolsky husband, he very convincingly told me that that document she showed me as a characteristic, um, self self characteristic. It was actually written by Shostakovich <laughs> on her, and he was saying to me that you can see how similar their handwriting. And this the similar <coughs> message was communicated to me by Olga Gladkova. So it's a lot of so when I saw this document, I thought, oh. How interesting. So I don't know who is right and I'm only presented. If it's, a, if it's some kind of myth, then forgive me. Uh, well, the examples of the teacher-student relationship I was working, um, referring to uh, is two of my teachers, my piano teachers from my early years as a piano student in Durham. And they had, they, um, the younger, 
woman studied with the older one and then they played in the piano duet for the whole of their lives and their handwriting is perfectly similar, you cannot make the difference. So, if anything, if this is true, this only could speak against Ostrowska's later uh, position that she never was influenced by Shostakovich and she never was close to him. It's, by the way, rather amazing that the name of Shostakovich has hardly been mentioned today because <laughs> you cannot read any article or read a review on, on Oswalska or it's also about Shostakovich. Uh, and I must say, I'd, I had ho a little hoped that a little hope that one of well, our Russian friends would have maybe more to say about it because we are all, I mean, we here in the West are all depending on uh, 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 second-hand, well, not second-hand, but um, uh, well, second-hand information, so to say. I mean, we have no access uh, to the uh, to the sources. What I would like to know, for instance, um, one of the things that has been said over and over again, uh, and I read somewhere, I think, that Shostakovich may have written this in a letter to Denisov, anyhow, that he was defending uh, his people, uh, Uzvalskaya, uh, more than once in the, uh, uh, the Composers' Union against attacks on her so-called formalism. And I think this is also in the brochure which is uh, published by uh, Sikorsky. Um, and which is written by uh, Victor Suslin. And I remember that in later years, let's say in the mid-90s, I think, uh, Ossolskia came to Holland and has been interviewed at the time for a Dutch weekly, not by me. Um, and uh, Suslin was there as well. And then he said, well, this is not true at all. Shostakovich didn't hardly did do anything for her. Well, maybe once, but not twice. And not I would like to know if any of you uh, uh, can give any more factual information on, on this topic. I, 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 can, only, I can only try it. Um, I had a conversation with Victor Suslin. I, I went to Hamburg and um, the, city, in the city where he lives, and we had a, I spent all day talking to him and looking through uh, a lot of documents. And he showed me the copy um, of the letter. I'm now trying to remember who this letter was addressed to. But the letter was communicating. Some, somebody, somebody asked Suslin about the situation, whether Shostakovich defended Ostrolska. And it was about one particular situation. Um, she was in her second year of the conservatoire. <clears throat> And after the, fi after the final exam of the second year, most of the people on the panel believed that she should not be allowed to proceed because her music was so new and uh, they didn't quite think that it is right and right enough level or standard for a student of St. Petersburg Conservatoire. And the common knowledge, Sutlin told me, that um, it was Shostakovich who protected and who spoke for Stvolska and because of, because of whom she was allowed to continue. In this letter he showed me, and I, I, I have a copy of it in, 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 my, sort of in my possession, um, it's a conversation, it's a description of a conversation between Suslina and Stvolska, where Stvolska says that it was not Shostakovich who protected her. Shostakovich did not say a word, there were two other um, teachers from the St. Petersburg Conservatoire who wrote a petition and sort of because of whom she allowed to continue. And this was sort of put down in the letter which Suslin sent to, I, I, I really cannot remember who, who it was, I will look through my document if somebody is interested. And uh, this is as much as I know and I know it from him because it was in a personal interview. But I'm afraid this is the only, this is the only proof, so I don't know. Well, it, it's maybe it's not the, the, the biggest question, but still, I mean, uh, the, the, the letters and statements of Uzovsky from her later life in the 90s have been have been so much quoted, and again and again, and and while well, he is she's so heavy attacking on Shostakovich, 
It's we, so I'm curious to know about uh, the, the other side of the story. Well, I have no facts to contribute. That pro probably an opinion why this theme has not been under discussion today. Uh, well, why I didn't engage with that, because I think everybody who reads the interviews and the oft-quoted statements of, and the attacks on Shostakovich and the Shostakovich chapter in Olga Vladkova's monograph, everybody feels that this kind of attitude to the teacher and uh, regardless to what he did to her or, and, I don't know, this kind of attitude to a colleague is not a very ethical or solid thing. It's ethically suspect. And in the context of a tribute, an homage to the composer, it's just not a very pleasant thing to do to engage with this topic. So probably the more painful issues will have to wait till um, an independent conference. <laughs> I do agree with what you just said, um, but I do believe that there is some merit in looking at the reverberations of um, Shostakovich's music in Ospolskaya's music and vice versa, of course. Um, but uh, from, uh, to offer my opinion on why I didn't really touch on Shostakovich much today was because, um, as mentioned earlier, Ospolskaya's music, um, if it's strong, it sh should and can stand by itself. and. Um, there is merit in considering Shostakovich, but this sort of fascination with Shostakovich um, all the time that elevates the attention that she gains um, is not always very helpful for the um, Fool's Guide team. And also the fact that neither of us has devoted significant time to Shostakovich's Fosco relationship professional or personal, testifies that it is not such a thing to keep objecting against because, uh, well, I think partly the intention behind these attacks was to dissociate her as a composer and as a person. And if this is not longer an issue, which, and this is, this is the proof of, of it, the, this conference, so probably the attacks itself should uh, well, there are at least two documents uh, which uh, confirm that relationships between Shostakovich and Ostolska uh, have been very close, really. And one is uh, the text of Ostolska's interview with Sofia Henchova, published in the Henchova's book, uh, Miri Shostakovich, Shostakovich's World, which unfortunately is not translated at, and cannot be published because of the uh, veto by Henchova's son, who wants too much money for, for this publication to, to be printed in the West. But that's an amazing document, and I'm sure we, all, all you will know about this, um, which uh, well, it, it's a, in Ostwolski's own words, a story, uh, amazing story of, of their very close relationships. And not only in terms of love affair, but also in terms of um, trusting each other. Uh, and it's well known that uh, Ostwolski kept uh, a number of Shostakovich's score, on, on scores, on, on public scores, including the gamblers, until the very late, uh, because obviously the, the second movement of Viola Sonata was based on the material from the gamers, and at that time Shostakovich asked Ostolsky to return the score. So there is still track of, of many, many facts. Um, and the second document was mentioned to me by Irina Antonovna Shostakovich, who actually was the only person who read uh, the collection of, of the letters from Ostolsky to Shostakovich, which she discovered after Shostakovich death in his flat. And she, well, she sent these letters back to Ostwolska, of course, because as Irina Antonovna said, they were so personal and so passionate that she, she felt uh, Ostwolska should have them. And of course, Ostwolska uh, burned them. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um,
may I ask another question, uh, especially to our Russian colleagues? Um, we've been told, uh, and we have read always, that the music of Ustvalskaya uh, has hardly been played in the uh, Soviet Union, at least her main work, the work that she wrote for herself, so to say. But um, can any of you uh, uh, specify on this? I mean, I have no idea if there were periods that she was not played at all, because we all know that a, a lot of her works were only after 10 or 15 years uh, uh, premiered. Uh, but I have no idea about, about the facts of, let's say, the, uh, the, the performance practice of Uzvalskia in the Soviet Union. Do you? Well, um, I, I, I think I have a few sort of things to say about it. Um, first of all, um, I've consulted all, all the publications, the tiny little concert reviews which have been written in Russia since um, 1949. And I have to say that um, in, in the late 90s and early 50s, her works were performed. And we are talking about the Stepan Razin, we are talking about Detska Suita, we are talking about all the works which she later destroyed. She was known, she was praised, she was not criticized. All, all those reviews, I've, I've got them, most of them are very complimentary, uh, saying how wonderfully she felt the atmosphere in the country and how rightly and well she writes. Yes, sometimes it's criticized. It's it's a little bit too similar. The orchestral language maybe it's is not as fulfilling as Shostakovich. But she was performed and she was praised. As for um, the early 70s, I um, when I was in Saint Petersburg, I studied with Oleg Malov for five years, and I started um, studying in 1993. But um, he was my teacher for five years, and we did a lot of concerts together. And I know from him, because all the scores and with Stvolska inscriptions on all of them, I, I have them, all of them have a dedication to Oleg Malov, the most wonderful musician. I'm talking about all piano sonata, I'm talking about grand duet, all the compositions. And I know it from him, and not because I trust him, but because I went to those concerts, starting from 1972. He performed her works continuously, regularly, participating at the um, annual events uh, called um, oh God, Contemporary Music Festival in Leningrad, Musicalny Puti. And when I started with, studying with him in um, 1993, I went to all those concerts. I, I, I heard him playing Symphony Number no. 5, all the compositions all the piano sonatas, and he involved us. I mean, when I studied with him, I didn't learn it because I, I have to be honest, I, I couldn't feel that I could relate to it, and he, he, didn't, he didn't insist. But we were there, we looked at those scores, we discussed it, and I have lots of different publications, sort of from the 80s and 90s in Russia, sort of no, from uh, mid-70s to um, early 90s when she forbade him to perform his works the publications by Leonid Garkil and many, many reviews. And Leonid Garkil, for example, he called Oleg Malov the Apostle of Galina Ustvolska because he performed her works regularly. But, but was he a single apostle? Was he a singularity, so to say? Well, um, I have to say that, uh, as I said, I, studied, uh, I started studying with him in 1993, and his name was singularly associated with Ustvolska in St. Petersburg. Then it was Alexei Lubimov, a little bit later, I would say maybe late 80s, 90, uh, 90, um, early 90s. But at the time, sort of mid 70s to um, uh, mid 80s, the name of Malek Malov and St. Petersburg musicians, he, all the people he performed this work with, this was the name associated with Galina Ostorska directly. Three years ago, I interviewed a pianist, Sergei Maltsev, who is an older generation than Alek Malov, slightly older, but he was acquainted with Estvolska before Malov. And he told me that she was performed in, at the Composers' Union's events and at all those festivals, 
maybe not more than other composers, but not less than the other composers. And uh, even if the press, the uh, journalists did not describe the music as probably she wanted, did not understand as she, she thought would be appropriate, the, indeed the reception was positive. So, uh, well, I know it's only from um, second-hand information, but this is what uh, people told me about the time before the mid-70s even, so probably starting 60s. And um, also Sergei Banevich, who was also her uh, student and very well-known composer, he, he told me also that her music was performed and he was hardly ever criticized because he, he told me that sort of she had this kind of reputation of of a genius, so even if sometimes people couldn't quite understand what it is all about, it was almost sort of forbidden to say anything negative. So there was some kind of, well this is what he told me, there was some kind of an aura of um, mystery and respect and understanding that they are in the presence of, of, of a genius. But she was, she was performed and um, there were reviews and yeah, it wasn't completely sort of out of... Well, my memory goes back a bit further, uh, and I remember, <laughs> I remember 1960s when I was a student, uh, late 1960s, and we didn't know who Stolska was. We simply didn't know. And uh, it's not to say that the students were not interested in modern music. Uh, well, we did try to perform uh, Schnitke, Denisov, Gubaidulin, Tishenko, Piart, Grabowski, Sylvester, all these people, they were coming to Moscow and I remember first ever festival of modern music in 1971. We didn't even think of Ostolska and so, and so didn't our friends such as Alyosha Lubimov who was present or Boris Berman or you know, the other people uh, who used to play modern music like Lev Mikhail Klenitis for instance. I don't know why, and I quite agree that Ostwolska was never actually at that time regarded as, as someone who was avant-garde composer. And there were no negative uh, opinion about, opinions about her music officially, but not much opinions in general. So we thought, well, it's such a strange lady living in St. Petersburg, or maybe her music is kind of joke or something like that. Uh, it's really interesting, yeah? And uh, I also remember um, Stislav Rostropovich, who well, obviously the grand duet was written for him. And when he first uh, heard it played by Stolska on piano, well, he was shocked because he thought, well, it's impossible to play it. Because it's not only uh, would be um, dangerous for him to play, but also even more dangerous for Stolska. And he didn't play the piece for 40 years. 40 years, this is amazing. Yeah. Not, uh, get these stories together because you say she was not criticized and she was played what I also heard you know, and you say he didn't dare to play her piece why not maybe he didn't like it at all <laughs> and he, he made some May, maybe he didn't like it actually I quite agree because uh, what he told me he felt at the time that is it's simply uh, uh, too uh, harsh music, you know, it's just impossible to play it uh, in a concert of standard repertoire, which Rastropovich did play at the time. Later on he became much more uh, left orientated, you know, but at, at, at the height of his Soviet career, uh, he, well, he, he, he wanted to play more of standard repertoire. Yeah, so uh, he didn't have the courage to, yes. to make a, yeah. a pledge for her music. So that's another story. Yeah. Maybe. Um, I wanted to change direction slightly and, and ask two questions. She's probably expecting this about Rachel's uh, uh, paper. Um, you mentioned um, Uspensky's uh, publication. So this is the Obrazi um, Raspira. Um, and you mentioned, if I didn't misunderstand you, the amongst the modernisms of, of, uh, that Dostoevsky found in Znavichan, uh, the, the possibility of, of harmony. Um, 
uh, it struck me that the example you played is actually an old believer example and of course totally monophonic, admittedly with uh, strange uh, microtonal tunings. But um, it's important, I think, to note that in the Uspensky anthology there is polyphony as well. And, and because you can't tell how the old believers would have sung or still do sing, as normally from looking at Uspensky's anthology, at the monophonic stuff. What you can tell is how weird the harmony is. So I, I would, just wanted to be sure that you were including the harmony in that or, 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 or not. Yes, yes, I was including the harmony in that because it's very striking for this um, anthology. The, the, the strange harmonies, as you say, which is very would be very attractive to us, Will Sky. Um, but uh, I also use the anthology as to demonstrate the, the various characteristics of the chant melody um, that are startlingly obvious in every example: the stepwise movement, the yeah. lack of metric hierarchy, etc., yeah. etc. Et um, so. Um, yes, but as you say, the Old Believer chant is monodic. There's, um, we don't know how it exactly it would have been sung, but the example I showed was melodic, monodic, and um, well, the, it always is because they don't use harmony at all. Yes, and <laughs> um, the the other branch, just to, to clarify, the other branch of um, Russian Orthodox Church music um, after the schism in the 17th century um, is what you the result of which you hear in an Orthodox church today, which is polyphonic setting of sometimes uh, the original melodies, you know, it's an Amelie Raspberry still. And on that topic, it brings me to my second point, which is you mentioned the Rachmaninoff uh, vigil, um, but the examples you showed from uh, Tchaikovsky and Rimsky Korsakov were both from um, orchestral pieces, choral orchestral pieces, but it might be worth noting that they also made settings of choral music. Um, Tchaikovsky wrote his own vigil, on uh, um, uh, chant melodies, and Rimsky did as well. He wrote a, not, not a full vigil, but he wrote a set of chants when he was chapel master. He wrote a set of chants, uh, 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 harmonized chants, which are actually very interesting. I, I think you've also touched on a very interesting um, topic that I didn't really have time to go in in my um, lecture, um, of how, mu how instrumental music can assume, if you like, the personality of a, of, a, of a cantor, it can sing without the text. So I did explain in my lecture how the musical line is in, individual, indivisible from the text, where there is a vocal line, where there is an narrator in a Spolskaya's music. But I think I would go as far to say that um, the, the personality, if you like, of the instrumental line assumes the same uncompromising purpose as a cantor would do in a similar position. And um, you can refer to other um, Soviet composers. Um, take, for example, Alexander Kneifel, um, Time Behold Now, um, Snowflake on the Spider Thread. Um, this is a piece of solo cello, but includes um, a text. And the text is to be uh, learned by the cellist and not actually uttered during the performance of the piece. Um, but it just shows the correlation between the instrumental line that you just hear as the, your, your listening experience is to only hear the um, instrumental line on the cello, but there is this, there is this line of text going on underneath it, um, and the melodic instrumental line is wholly indebted to that text, absolutely dependent on that text. The, the phrase length, the melody, the rhythmic inflections are all absolutely dependent on the text. So this idea, if we superimpose it onto, into, onto us full skies um, music, we can see how even though it's instrumental music and not, um, a, a, not a, a copy, if you like, of uh, a can, the cantor tradition, it is certainly a direct descendant of the Znamini tradition. So, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Hello, Sheng Schein from Leiden University. Um, I'm a bit reluctant to pose this question as I could not attend the full symposium, but still I will. Um, um, I'm interested in historical context and um, I would like to know what Ustvolskaya's position was against the um, historical avant-garde, um, so the music of Roslavlets, for example, or Mosolov, or the music of Victory Over the Sun. Was that music still available for students like Uzvolskaya? And if so, um, do you know if she used it and if she was influenced by it? 
Nordish music was not available for the students. And even uh, to say more, if you're interested in music by Hindemith or Stravinsky, uh, you wouldn't be able to get this course from the library, say, in Moscow Conservatory. Or even you may be expelled from the conservatory if you are interested in this course, unfortunately. It, it makes a very interesting reading, actually, if you take the textbooks for the students published in late 1950s. Uh, how, for instance, Stravinsky and Hindemith have been described. You know, I recommend you read it if you can get hold. Uh, it's comic, really, yeah? uh, rather than anything else. Uh, but uh, I don't think, you know, maybe Rachel knows more about this, I don't think that uh, Ostrovsky was actually particularly interested in learning uh, Roslevitz or Mosolov's music or scores, because I think they are quite different from what she was doing. Well, Roslevitz in particular. Yes, of course. Yeah. But the, the, the thing that triggered me was uh, also the, the lecture by uh, uh, the quote about the... Um, uh, metaphors of the um, um, uh, of stones and of cosmology that is also very typical of the avant garde. So, um, of course, I won't question the exceptionality of Vysotsky, but still, there is historical context, and I'm just interested in what it could be. If it's not Shostakovich, is it is it something else, or did it just come out of, of thin air or out of granite, as Mr. Groth uh, argues? Well, I don't think it, it's coming from nothing. It, it's uh, surely influenced by Mussorgsky, if anything else. Yeah? Uh, I don't know why uh, Ostwolsky never acknowledged this. Uh, her music is also influenced by Shostakovich, for sure. Uh, for instance, early Shostakovich and uh, repetitiveness in his music of 1920s, in particular, before he changed his style after 1936, uh, but also after that. Uh, but I think uh, the uniqueness of Ostwolska, and sometimes it happens with the composers, uh, that she, uh, for whatever reason, was influenced more by music uh, written uh, in the past, rather by the music of immediate uh, contemporaries or uh, composers who lived immediately before her. And sometimes it happens. Uh, I'm sure uh, there are some other examples of this. Uh, so it's kind of uh, what uh, what we can find in, in the 20th century music and what is called neoclassicism, for instance. Uh, uh, so if we take it as an example, yeah, then in Ostrovsky's case, it was uh, neo um, uh, old believer music or <laughs> neo pre Peter the Great music, which was in its turn implemented in Mussorgsky's course, of course. Thank you very much. Uh, I should like to add indeed that the uh, imagery of, of crystals or diamonds and stones were very much apparent in the 1950s for instance also in relation to avant-garde so it's, a, it's an old topos I think at least relatively uh, known topos before the application to Oswalskaya indeed that's true um, I think we have come to the end of our symposium Oswalskaya New Perspectives maybe it's the first symposium on her music I don't know uh, or one of the firsts, maybe. Um, and I'd like to thank very much on behalf of the Musikgebouw A, uh, Asko Schoenberg and the University of Amsterdam. Of course, the, the speakers, the distinguished speakers, the musicians, who played wonderfully, the piano sonatas. <laughs> the organization and the technical uh, support was a perfect day, so thank you also very much. And of course, you as a public, with your sustained interest, usually in conferences you see people leaving one by one like an Abschied symphony, <laughs> and at the end you have about ten left. But I think more and more people came actually today. <laughs> it's the reverse, so it's a very, very promising sign for new perspectives. Thank you very much. Excuse me, can I just say a few words, or, uh, first of all, uh, to thank the organizers, because that's a very hard job to organize a symposium, 
And so many thanks, Professor de Grob, many thanks, uh, Elmer Schoenberger, and everyone here, of course. Unfortunately, I don't know all the names. <laughs> it's, it's a very hard job, and uh, we are very, very grateful to you for organizing this.